Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. It's KLOS New and Approved. And I have a guest today who I have so much respect for. I've been a fan of his for years and his band. And speaking of new, there's a new box set out that's amazing. It's nine vinyl albums, six CDs. It's available digitally. And it is the third in the volume of Def Leppard box sets. It's called Volume 3. And I'm here right now with Joe Elliott. Joe, great to see you, man. How you doing? Good to see you too. So soon after our last e-meeting or whatever they're called. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's always great to reconnect with you. And it's, it's good that I've been able to do it more than once lately. Joe, so, you know, I love that you guys, this box set is really special to Def Leppard fans and who are fans like myself. Also, you know, we've had this conversation before about how, you know, my musical taste is so in line, <clears throat> excuse me, my musical taste is so in line with yours. Like, it's funny, like we must have grown up exactly around the same time because all the stuff that's been a big inspiration to Def Leppard and to you and that you've done on the uh, on the Yeah album and, and the artists that you talked about and that you featured in the Rocket video are all artists that, you know, people like myself loved growing up as well. Talk to me about your formative years, when you discovered rock and roll and, you know, uh, talk, talk to me about that. Tell me when you when you really, when it really grabbed a hold of you. Well, it, it was very early on. I mean, in fairness, I grabbed all the rock and roll, but it wasn't my generation of rock and roll to grab hold of. I was maybe four years old when I heard the Beatles love me do for the first time. And I just wanted to be Paul McCartney, you know, and it was it was one of those things where they're not they're not even phantom memories. They are stories told to me by you know, my parents, my aunties and uncles about, oh, when we used to come around to your house, you'd crawl towards the radio if a song came on that you liked. And so it started off with the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and the Who, but I didn't feel, I, I realize now that I didn't belong. I just was aware of them. When it first clicked with me was, I'd be 10 or 11 years old when I first saw Mark Boland and T-Rex on top of the Pops. And then when I'd have been, 12 and I saw David Bowie on top of the pops doing Starman. I was hooked then. I was I was literally obsessed from that moment onwards to, to this day now. Um Bowie Bowl and all that kind of British glam rock stuff, that's my era of music. I've learned to appreciate all the bands that came before. And because time's caught up, there isn't that much difference really now in the year 2021 between say 1964 and 1972 there isn't that big a deal but there was back then it was almost a decade and when you're a kid that's a long time it seems to be a couple of weeks when you get to the, the age that i am now <laughs> but uh, yeah yeah so you know we we were we were in a kind of an either an unfortunate or a fortunate position depending on your point of view in england we didn't have radio like you have in the states where there's maybe three or four stations per city that play rock and roll, or there was in the 70s and the 80s, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We had one top 40 station, and that was it. So amongst all the dross, um, you got the odd song. And when you did get the odd song, whether it be, as you guys called it, Bang a Gong by T-Rex or Starman, anything off the Ziggy Stardust album, or a couple of years later, Sweet, Queen, Slade, these songs became really precious because it was like mining for gold, you know, between every uh, Donny Osmond, Murray Osmond song or tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, you yeah. might get Starman or you might get Metal Guru by T-Rex or a sweet tune and they became part of your DNA because you'd waited forever to hear them. You had three minutes and then you had to save your pocket money up to run down to the record store and buy you know, you spend your dinner money on a, on a seven-inch vinyl single. That's that's how my formative years were lived out. You know, I would not eat for, for the whole day so I could save my dinner money to buy a record on Friday, you know. And, uh, you know, no regrets because this is the stuff that put me where we, you know, put me where I am today. It really has. It's amazing. You know, I can just, I can imagine you hearing Ballroom Blitz for the first time like I did here on the radio at a Top 40 station and going, Wow, what is this? And just yep. being obsessed till you could get to the record store to buy it, right? I mean, to that moment. Yeah, it, it was a it was a weird time because I didn't have any older siblings, so I didn't have an older brother to kind of rummage through the record collection of, like, say, Sav did. Um, so, like, specifically in Leopard, me and Phil being only children, 
we literally had to make it up as we went along or go around to friends' houses and see what they had. And so you'd trade records. I remember a friend of mine in Sheffield had the uh, Phenomenon by UFO and I had the first Montrose album. And we were trying to outdo each other so which one was the best. So it was end of the day, you just swapped. And then he's like, actually, they're both great. And then you'd build a collection up in your mind as well as in your, in your, on your record shelf, you know. Um, a lot of illegal taping of records was done by British kids back in those days. Of course. Thank God for kids. <laughs> yeah, that's great. UFO Phenomenon and Montrose's debut album. Two great records, right? I mean, those are incredible albums. Now, you also mentioned yeah. to me once before Montrose about... Montrose was probably the first... Montrose was possibly, other than Credence, the first American rock band I was ever aware of. Um, because American rock bands really didn't get played in, in, in the UK except Creedence. For some reason, Creedence Clearwater Revival had dozens of hits in the UK. Um, so I was madly in love with John Fogerty's voice. I just thought, you know, things like, have you ever seen the rain? You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, it was Fortunate Son. These were just insanely great songs and his voice was just to die for, you know. As a kid, I was such a fan of uh, Cosmos Factory album with these 14 minutes, you know, I heard you through the grapevine and stuff like that. I was very young to be into that kind of music because like I said, my neighborhood friend who was three years older, had all the Jethro Tull, um, Free, Cat Stevens, Mop the Hoople, all this kind of stuff. So he got me into what was probably badly christened prog rock back in those days. But Island Records was a, was a haven for superb artists in the late 60s, early 70s. And that's what I was weaned on until I discovered my own stuff. And like I said, when once I got into the top of the pops routine of waiting for the one decent song, you started collecting your own ideas up here. And it was first album I ever owned was Electric Warrior. The first record I ever bought was Every Picture Tells a Story by Rod Stewart. And my record collection just grew from there. So it wasn't all glam. It was there was a lot of kind of a lot of Motown. I was a big fan of, of the Jackson 5 and Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and Super, Diane Ross and the Supremes and the Four Tops, Temptations, all that kind of stuff. I loved all that kind of stuff. Edwin Starr, War, great yeah. song, you know. Um, so I was into songs and that's how it was because all I could afford was one at a time. <laughs> and that's all we ever heard was one at a time on the radio. Ten crap songs and one good one, you know. Yes. Um, album rock was not a, a big thing when you were ten. It's something you grew into when you had four paper rounds, like I did, and you could afford to buy an album a week instead of a seven-inch single. That's amazing, Joe. Because my that's what I did: paper routes and mowing lawns in New Jersey. That's how yeah. I bought my records as a kid. And Cosmos Factory yeah. was one of the first, was one of those albums when I was a really young yeah. kid. It's just one of the best. That Creedence record you mentioned. Yeah. You know, it's still a go-to record every couple of months. Yeah, I, ne I never tire of it, you know? You know, this record, like I said, it's it's amazing. I love when you did Yeah, I was so excited because I love that list. And we should also mention, you know, there's the record X is on here, songs from the Sparkle Lounge, there's great stuff. But I mean, for the fans too, there's all those B-sides. There's the Yeah covers B-sides. There's the live Yeah performance uh, disc yeah. as well. Which is so cool because there's a lot of Brian May on there with you guys. And then, you know, there's speaking of Creedence, you cover Travel and Band, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. It's so. With Brian May. Yeah. Can we, you know, and yeah. I wanted to ask you this, Joe. You know, one of my favorite performances of all time, uh, obviously, I loved Freddie. And then everybody you were on stage with, I think, in just one of the epic rock and roll live moments is at the Freddie Mercury Tribute concert with you guys on stage doing all the young dudes, you know? Um, so can we talk about what led up to that and what, what did that feel like that at that moment? Because these are some of your heroes uh, that you love that you were playing with. Obviously the band, Def Leppard had already gotten to a great point of success at this, at this point. So, you know, you had their respect as well. Um, but talk to me about how that transpired and what it felt like that night. Uh, it was, with the greatest respect to everything that this band has done, it has to be one of the best three or four minutes of my life on stage, was getting up to do that number for various different reasons. We were celebrating uh, the life and times of Freddie Mercury, bringing AIDS awareness to the world, 
Um, we were number one all over the world with Adrenalize and Let's Get Rocked uh, at the time of, of that concert. And so many of our musical heroes were there. Obviously, the remaining members of Queen, they had Tony Iommi playing rhythm guitar for Brian for nearly the entire set. Tony from Black Sabbath. Um, and you're looking at all the different singers that were there, Roger Daltrey, uh, Robert Plant, um, and the bands that performed, like GNR, ourselves. It was, it was an incredible moment. But to see everybody that meant anything to us as a collective band or us as individuals, being on stage at the one time doing the anthem of our generation, as far as I'm concerned, was just unbelievable. You're looking at, as I said, the remaining members of Queen with Mick Ronson on guitar, David Bowie playing the sax, and Ian Hunter singing. Um, and it was one of those moments where Brian said, you're going to get up and do the backing vocals. And I said, you try stopping me. You know? <laughs> and I remember I grabbed Phil. Phil was a little reluctant at first. I said, dude, if you don't do this, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. And I almost like kind of kidnapped him. Yeah. dragged him on with me and so the two of us you know shadowing either side of brian may and singing with this guy that had become a lifelong friend of ours a decade earlier anyway you know and it was just a magical moment you know it, it can't be replicated i can do some amazing things from now till the day that we don't do this anymore and we have done some amazing things you know starting that back in 1979 but that four minutes was the that was, the, you know, the, the cherry on top of the immense cake. It was just phenomenal. It, even now, thinking about it, airs on my arms are getting all weird. <laughs> it's just a fantastic thing that we were in the right place at the right time. It was nothing to do with us. That song was obviously chosen by, I would imagine, Brian uh, and, and, and Roger, who would have been the two that had more say than anybody else. Mark the Hooper were the only were, uh, were Queen were the only band that the the only band that Queen ever opened for was Mark. So there's a connection there with Mark. Um, they said that they learned a lot of their craft off watching Mark every night. So there's a, there's a love and a respect between Queen and Mark the Hooper. So when they when they were doing their thing with Fred to break ranks and actually do a non-Queen song, uh, the only two people they did that with I think was Bowie and and Ian was was an, a magnificent thing. And when we got wind of the fact that they were going to do that. Um, it's like, wow, Bowie, Hunter, Ronson and Queen doing dudes in front of a billion and a half people on TV and 90,000 people in the stadium. Oh, got to be part of this, you know, it's <laughs> history in the making. It was like coattail riding to the greatest extent, but glad I did, you know. That song's always been in our periphery. You know, it's always been in and around us. Everybody knows it's my favorite song. We've done it with Ian and it's on this box set. Um, we did it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with, with Ian and a, a plethora of special guests. Susanna from the Bangles, um, Stevie, Ray, uh, Miami Steve from Springsteen's band. There was Colin Bluntstone and Rod Argent from the Zombies. Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music all wanted to get up and do it. That song also resonated with them. They weren't necessarily because they were big Def Leppard fans, big fans of the song. And it was like, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, that'd be great. What an honor to share the stage with, with that lot as well, all those years later. Yeah, what an amazing thing. I mean, I, I look at that and I say to myself, wow, you know, that must have been an incredible moment. So I, I love hearing that. You know, uh, one of the songs that's a favorite of some of the DJs here uh, is your cover of David Essex, the David Essex song, Rock On, which was a 45 I bought as a kid back in 1973, you know, when it came out. Another one of those records I mowed a lawn to buy. You know what I mean? And uh, the, you know, it was covered. The only your cover is great of it. There was a pop cover, came out I think in the '90s or 2000s. That I was not fond of. It was you know just it was too sugary, and they you know it was too overproduced. But the original in your version is great. I mean they're, they kill. Tell me about uh, was that one of those records top of the pops? Because David Essex I know had quite a few hits in England, but only that one hit here. You know. Yeah, a little bit like T-Rex, you know, they were, T-Rex were like, in the press, they were always called like, you know, the, as big as the Beatles in the UK. But it didn't really cross over to, to the USA, except for the one top 10 hit with um, Bang A Gong. 
David Essex, same thing. David Essex had a lot of hits. I think that was the first song that I ever heard him do. And it was just, there was something about it. I think there's, in the embryonic youth that we were, you don't know you're going to become a musician, but it's almost like if it's in your destiny to, to become one, the reason you do become one is because you pick up on the little nuances of why certain songs stick out more than the rest. And the fact that you had this slapback echo on the bass was like, okay, what's that? I wouldn't have known that's what it was called when I was 12, 13, but you knew it was an echo. That's all we knew it as. Um, and nobody had ever heard that before. And I believe it was played by Herbie Flowers, who's been so iconic on, you know, he played the bass line on Walk on the Wild Side for Lou Reed. This guy's done a lot of stuff, played with Bowie, played with T-Rex, um, and obviously played on the David Essex song, produced by Jeff Wayne, who did the War of the Worlds soundtrack a few years later very renowned British producer. And um, he was one of those songs that just, even if you had to kind of quietly admit it because you were a, a fan of Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and Uriah Heep, kids would, as we call it, brown paper bag that song. You know, there was a walk into the record store and kind of under their breath go, can I get the new David Essex single, please? As they did with Crazy Horses by the Osmonds. Right. I know. Tons of people that did that. Right, because that, that was the was only good song. That was the one song where the Osmonds rocked out. There you go. But this is why I don't believe in guilty pleasures. I think that I've always been the guy that got beaten up in the schoolyard for saying I liked this song by the Osmonds or whatever, because the Slade fans would think that was sacrilege, you know. Um, and I was like, I don't get it. If you like it, you like it, you know. The two songs that there was, and it was just, there was, there wasn't even a vote. It was just unanimously thumbs up was Badfinger and David Essex. Yeah. The I, rest of them were easy, but those two were just, you know, we got to do rock on. Oh, God, yeah. And I think Phil suggested let's put the big heavy section on the end yeah. just to make it different and turn it more. In. The, the thing about that, that song, any of the songs on Yeah, is that they could have been Def Leppard songs. And by virtue of the fact that we did them, they are now Def Leppard songs because they show where we came from. You yeah. know, there's um, there's also a song called "He's Going to Step on You Again" by a South African artist John called Congos. John Congos. Yeah, which shows you that uh, when you listen to the kind of African hypnotic drum rhythm, was that an influence on Rocket? Of course it was, and we wanted people to see that. We weren't afraid to show the world where we came from. We wear everything on our sleeve, and somebody goes, "That song of yours sounds a bit like Joan Jett," or it sounds a bit like. Um, the arrows or it sounds a bit like whoever we go yep yeah are you surprised we bought that song as a kid every one of us loved susie quattro singles or slades or you know wizard roy wood anything to do with roy wood the move early elo roy wood and then when jeff lynn took over elo all that kind of stuff big big melodic tunes with massive drums massive guitars and huge choruses and hooks yeah. never forget the hook you, you know, know, you got to have hooks. Um, song, a song like Pour Some Sugar On Me should have been written in 1973. It just wasn't. So we did it in 87. <laughs> You're right. You know, the thing is, that's exactly what Def Leppard is and what's great about it and what we talked about. Those, like a Slade single, when it comes into that chorus and you hear Goodbye to Jane or, you, you know, or Come On Feel The Noise or any of those tracks, that's what I love is I can tell with you as a band and as a songwriter, you understand the value of a hook in a song. It's so important. It really is. It gives you something to grab a hold of. It's what you loved as a kid, you know? Absolutely right. But, we you know, we do kind of mix it. And it's, like, it's not like we're entirely Slade or entirely Sweet or, or whatever. <clears throat> the band's mantra has always been the power of ACDC and the variety of Queen. Mix right. the two together. And all those other elements are part of that anyway. Because a lot of Queen stuff... You know, it's early Queen, if we're talking like Queen 2, uh, Sheer Heart Attack, and then things like, you know, the, the trilogy of albums that they did, Mid-70s, Day of the Opera, uh, Night of the Opera, Day of the Races. News of the World. News of the World. Yeah, There's those albums. There's a lot albums, of that... stuff, as well as the theatrical Fred stuff. You, even We Will Rock You is straight out of glam. You know, Seven Seas of I was, um, Killer Queen, and all that kind of stuff. And we, don't get me wrong, you know, especially two guitarists like, Phil and now, you know, Vivian now, but back in the day, Pete Willis, Steve Clark. Yes. Big fans of Zeppelin. Pete was a big fan of Pat Travis. 
um, and, and Robin Trower, and Jimi Hendrix. Uh, Steve was a huge fan of Jimmy Page, Alex Lifeson, and a guy called Zal Clementson from the sensational Alex Harvey band. Right. So there was a lot of hard rock mixed in with the melody, but we figured if we can meld the two together, we got a unique kind of brand of stuff, you know. Yeah, you did, because it was heavier. Is a, is, a, is a big part of the ingredients. It is. I mean, that's you're right about that because it is heavier, and that's the one thing that's really cool. And you mentioned that part, that stretch of Queen albums are like my favorites. I mean, it was amazing. I got to see those guys do Night at the Opera, that tour at the Beacon Theater in New York City, and man, it was it blew my mind. I mean, it was because it was those first four records, you know, and sure hard. Totally undeniable. They were they were just <laughs> an absolute you know blueprint for a band like us. The harmonies, the the fact that they could. Uh, do we will rock you, and then they they're straight in as you know uh, some ballad, you know, uh, just Fred singing a cappella, you know, when you get to things like Bohemian Rhapsody, where it's like you you know you don't even have to hear that song ever again to appreciate what a game changer it was, and that was the kind of act that we really wanted to emulate, if you like, you know, not just some regular rock band that had one or two hits. These were lifers. They they were making a difference the way that the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and the Kinks did a, a decade before. We wanted to be the next decade's version of all those great bands. It doesn't matter whether we achieved it or not. It has to be the goal. Yeah. Um, it's for other people to decide way down the road whether we got there or not. We keep trying even now. We don't give up, you know. We weren't prepared to rely on just, oh, we've had two massive selling records, let's just quit. You know, we, we may have had our biggest sales that we'll ever achieve. But you still make great past. records. I mean, songs from the Sparkle Lounge. But it does we haven't written a, a better song than anything else. Whether it resonates is irrelevant, really. It's in our DNA to keep trying to write better songs or acknowledge great songs from the past. So, you know, with albums like Yeah, and in this box set, you've got yeah, too, where we all individually acknowledge a song from the past. When the when when we knew the album was coming out, and part of the part of the you know the 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 um when you put an album out in the nineties or in the early noughties, part of the, the the whole process was well, we need extra bonus tracks for these single CDs and stuff like that. Like four it's songs, like right? Four songs. Doing yeah. You just, a year doing 10, 12 songs, and then if they say there's four singles, they need another 16 tracks. You're like, where are you going to get that from? With the covers uh, project, it was so much easier because everybody went home. We all we did the album at my place. Everybody went home and in their own little collective studios said, look, just do whatever you want, you know? And I think Phil stuck around for a few days. So me and Phil did, um, we did When I'm Dead and Gone by McGinnis Flint. Right. With a nice little note. A little, nice little nod to Ooh La La by the faces on the end of it. Yes. Me and Sav did a Linda's Farm song called uh, Winter Song. Vivian sent me the backing track of American Girl. So we did Tom Petty. I sang that one. I did Slade, Jabriath, and uh, David Bowie. Sav did Queen. You know, and so we had all these like songs that collectively would have probably gone, really? But when we do them individually and send them out to each other, they go, my, that turned out really well. Good stuff, you know. Because, I mean, Phil did. Search and Destroy by Iggy and the Stooges, and he also did, but never used until now, Rock's, Rock's Hand by The Police, which is just him in a beatbox and a, a kind of a Hendrix guitar doing a real laid back version of it, which I remember saying to him when we came to doing this year two thing, you've got to put that on as a bonus track because it's, it's, it didn't get used back then, but I think it's important that it gets used now because historically it's part of the team, you know, and, and again, it's something new that's never seen the light of the day. Yeah, and Phil loved the police, you know what I mean? Especially if he was a big fan. You know, least favorite ever back. You know? Yeah, they're, they're so great. And I love, you know, the fact that you were talking about Queen and, you know, those early albums. You guys do not, Now I'm Here and Dear Friends, a cool version of Dear Friends on there as well, you know, which is... Yeah, I mean, Dear Friends on on, on uh, Cheer Heart Attack is actually kind of like a, it's like a, a piano ballad. Yeah, and it's really um, short too, you know? Yeah, and Sav did a version, and I think Sav's version is like a minute 12. Yeah. And he did it as like, a, he starts it off like Queen, but then it goes like punk. Yeah. And uh, there's a guitar lick at the end, which I'm sure Sav's not even aware of, but he's totally out of the Mick Ronson songbook. It's yeah. um, it's actually a sped up version of Ron Ronson's version of Love Me Tender by Elvis. Yeah. It's the same rundown. And it's like, again, it all ties in by accident. He wasn't even aware he'd, he'd actually channeled Ronson. 
So again, it all ties in beautifully. And like you say, you know, with Brian, there's, we even kind of co, um, co-titled one of the sides, the Brian May side. Yeah. Because three tracks are with Brian, which is now I'm here, uh, and the, an, an unreleased uh, edit of Traveling Band from 1983, 84 that we never released. And uh, 20th Century Boy from the, um, I think it was the Big In 05 uh, VH1 Awards. Yeah. Uh, when when he got, we did the T-Rex song. And then that side closes out with all the young dudes with uh, Ian Hunter. And again, that's why I called it the Brian May side, sort of, because the connection between Ian Hunter and Brian May is as strong as a connection between Brian May and Def Leppard. So th there's lineage there. I love that, that you, you did that as a full side on the vinyl. And it's, uh, it's really cool. I mean, all the way around. It's just the, the songs that you pick on there. You know, let's talk about, the. there's two other things that I found really interesting. I love that you do Only After Dark, which uh, a lot of people may or may not know um, because it's a great Mick Ronson song on his first solo album, Slaughter on 10th Avenue. It's a rocker from that album. But I know you became really close with Mick. And, you know, Mick to me is one of the most underappreciated, great guitarists, who's so important and responsible for what David, you know, David's bringing David's sound together on Ziggy. You know, like right when he joined around at the Hunky Dory time and playing on Queen Bitch. Tell me about um, your relationship with Mick, because I know you got, got to be very close. And you were in that dock, too, which was great. Yeah, I first met Mick Ronson um, in 1980 at the Ritz in New York. Um, we were on tour. Why would we have been in New York? We were, must have been opening for 1980. We were opening for Nugent, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was, it was Scorpions and Nugent. But anyway, we had a day, or maybe we, were, we weren't playing New York, but they'd driven me in to do press. And it coincidentally, Hunter Ronson band were playing the Ritz. And so the record label took me down there and somebody knew somebody at Chrysalis Records and they put me on the guest list. And I got to meet Ian for the second time. Um, he didn't remember meeting me the first time because I broke into their dressing room when the Overnight Angels band played Doncaster Gormont in 1977. But um, I met Mick and I remember the first thing he said to me was complete Yorks action. He was tiny shoelaces and he just looked at me and went, hey, up, lad, which is a complete Yorkshire thing to say. And, um, you know, I met him then. I met him about five years later in London at um, the Fulham Greyhound pub when he was playing piano for Lisa Dalbello. Um, and it was my 26th birthday. So it's been August the 1st, 1985. And we, because of my birthday, he, he bought a bottle of champagne and got drunk with me and that kind of stuff. So over the years, we met loads of times. In 88, I got up and jammed with him for the first time in Canada at um, Rock and Roll Heaven in Toronto. Um, did dudes again. <laughs> for Brighton, for the first time, we did dudes. Um, and Cleveland Rocks and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, over the years, I met him many, many times. And then one day I got a phone call from Ian and he said, um, I just had a call from Mick. He's got cancer. And uh, he says, we've got to rally around and do something. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he says, I don't know. I said, well, we'll put some money in. And he said, how much? I said, I'll match what Bowie puts in. So it turns out that myself, Ian, John Mellencamp, bless him, and, uh, and Bowie all put a some money into a kitty to, to help cover his, ex, you know. But I, more importantly, said, I have an idea. If we cover a mix song and put it on the B-side of Let's Get Rocked, if the song sells, he'll make the same royalties as, as we as the A-side. So um, that's why, that's the reason we did it. And we chose that song because it is the most leopard-like song in, in, in the two albums that Mick had at the time. And um, cut to a year later, I was working with him on his, what turned out to be his posthumous third solo album, Heaven and Hull, where I, I did a, a, a lot of singing, arranging and producing and mixing of that record after the fact. But I worked with him before. He was over at my studio um, in Dublin in, in 93. And when I did the vocal for Don't Look Down and, and for cover of this old punk song by an Australian punk band called, I forgot, sorry, forgive me. Um, a song called Take a Long Line. Um, Duff McKagan will never forgive me for getting the name of that band. Um, and we did a lot of work together. And sadly, we were in, it was on a 10 day break for Leopard Tour. And we got to Sweden for the first gig back after the break. And I got a phone call during Soundcheck that uh, he passed away the night before. Phil was actually with him two days before he passed. He sat with him in Haskell Street, which was Tony DeFries' house 
De Vries was the manager of Bowie when he was looking after Mick and, and David. And so, incredibly sad moment. But we played Ziggy Stardust that night on stage in, um, in Stockholm. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, I think it was Stockholm. <clears throat> It could have been Oslo, actually, in Norway. I'm not sure. It was a Scandinavia. And the whole crowd got it, you know, because Mick used to live there. And so they were all lights out and, and you know, paying homage to this beautiful soul that Mick Ronson was. Yeah, he's a great guy. You know, and a fantastic guitar player. He was great. You know, it's funny you said that story, Joe, because in 1980, he was playing in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and I snuck backstage. It was You Never Alone with a Schizophrenic Tour. And I snuck back to him and Ian, and the bouncers came back and said, what are you doing back here? And Mick, Mick said, no, he's cool. He's all right. He's with us. And let, let me hold his guitar. He was so kind to me. And, you know, obviously I, was, I loved him, you know, I, from the Ian Hunter stuff he had done uh, to all the Bowie records. And so, you know, it was, uh, you know, I'll never forget how, how nice he was to me. And, that, uh, that generation of bands were all like that. And I think it's, that stems a lot as well from Ian. When Mother Hoople were signed to Ireland the early days, 69 to 72, before Dudes was a hit. They used to have a, a you know, like the Stivers would follow them all over the country. One of them was Mick Jones from The Clash. Yeah. And they would jump the turnstiles, take the train, and then the guys would sneak them in because they weren't old enough and shove them down the front and buy them a drink and stuff like that, you know. Thin Lizzy used to let all the fans into the dressing room four at a time after a gig to get autographs and photos. And I was one of them once, and he like, this this is great, you know, you've got to pay forward. We try and do as best we can. It's a bit difficult in stadiums and, and arenas, but in the city halls, it was a lot easier to do. We've always tried to accommodate the fans as best we can, but they were very humble people. And Mick Ronson was a Yorkshireman. You know, you've got to remember that he tried it with Bowie, didn't think it was going to work and went back home and was working for the county council as a line painter for football. Yeah, pitches. right. It's in the movie. Yeah, I mean, he a- came back and said, Bowie, he wants you back down there. And he's like, I'm not really sure. <laughs> and then they went back down and they did Hunky Dory. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> and I've got to ask you too, Joe. You know, it's great you guys do Don't Believe a Word on there uh, by Lizzie, a band that I loved. You know, I got, again, it's funny, like T Rex, like David Essex, um, we're like one hit in America, you know, with, with Boys Are Back in Town. Besides, I mean, Jailbreak was played on FM radio, but as far as in the charts, uh, but I was a huge fan and saw the Johnny the Fox tour when they opened for Queen and then Better Reputation when they were headlining. What was that What was uh, that relationship like with you going back and were Lizzie guys really nice to you when you were a kid? Yeah, Lizzie, well, they, they certainly were, but I didn't get to know them because you were just in and out, you know. It was like when the Queen walks past and shakes hands with her, with her people, you know. You were quick for, oh, great gig, thanks, man, and off you went, you know. Yeah. But... Come 1980, when we got signed to the same label as Thin Lizzy, uh, Polygram Records in the UK, um, the guy that was looking after Lizzy would eventually be the guy that kind of came and looked after us when we went on the road. And because we were on the same label, we got invited to the show in Sheffield. And I got invited back to the hotel. And when I got back there, I was introduced to the band and Scott Gorham really took me under his wing. He was fantastic. The other guys were sweet. There's nothing... Phil Linnett was nothing but a sweetheart. But Scott Gore was like, hey, buddy, how's it going, man? Come sit down. You want a drink? Go get this boy a drink. You're like, whoa, you know, this is great. And I've been friends with Scott Gore ever since. In fact, I um, I worked with him on um, a Ricky Warwick solo record 20 years ago. We got him to play some guitar parts. And then because of that, he was um, he called me up and he says, we're going to kind of revamp Thin Lizzy. And I want Ricky to be the singer. And he, he'd thought of that after working with me and Ricky on his solo album. And then uh, uh, just a couple of years after that, even, uh, they wanted to do some remixes of some early Lizzie work. And he said, will you do them with me and Brian Downey? And I'm like, I'd be honored. So we got into Joe's garage, my studio. We had the tapes baked because they're all falling to pieces and transferred them into Pro Tools so that we were now clear. Um, started listening through to the tracks and you could have, I mean, if you could have seen the face on those guys when they realized that we discovered a long lost verse in Boys Are Back In Town that didn't get used. It was priceless because the BBC shot it for a documentary. And I said to the guys, film them when they hear this because I want to see their faces on camera. Wow. (laughs) And it really was miraculous. And as was explained to me by both Brian Downey and 
uh, Scott Gorham. He said, well, you've got to realise, like, we'd lay down the backing tracks and then go to the pub and leave Phil to do the singing. So if he sang something that didn't get used, we wouldn't have known he did it. And it makes total sense. But when we discovered it, we're like, well, we have to do a version with this on as well as a bonus track. But it was it was insane to feed uh, Phil and its bass into um, what was actually um, Adam Clayton's bass rig. We borrowed it um, and fed it in DIYs and mic'd it up. So every time we press play, we were hearing a 1970, actually it was, the album came out in 76, we were hearing a played in 1975 bass line coming out live into the studio so that we could EQ it with what was then 2010 technology. And, you know, it was, it was mind blowing. It was like Back to the Future, but a way cooler version. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, that must have been such an incredible day. Scott Gorham yeah. is such a yeah. good dude. You know, he, He's from right by here, you know, near Pasadena and Glendale's where he grew up, you know, and, uh, you know, it's that great story about he went over there um, with uh, a, another guy who ended up being the drummer in Supertramp. He thought he was going to be in oh, Supertramp. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I know, well, his, I know his son, you know, I know. Yeah. It's his, it was his brother-in-law. Yeah, his brother-in-law. Yeah, he married Scott's sister. So it's, I love that. And he got the audition for Lizzie, which is just what, I mean, you know, it's, it's good thing they they hired a sax player instead, because then he got to you know. Yes, <laughs> it would have been a bizarre, a bizarre twist of fate, sliding doors moment yeah. if he'd have ended up in Summertime playing the lead solo in Dreamer. Or something. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Hey, you know what I meant to say to you too? Uh, I don't know if you knew this, Joe, because I know how much you love T Rex. Uh, do you know? Did anybody ever tell you? Because it's not a lot of people know this, but the reason why they called it Bang a Gong in America instead of Get It On. Did I? You know, you know about that? I know. Because that band changed. Because of um, Marvin Gaye. Yeah, there was also... No, actually, see, see, here's the thing. People thought that was the reason. But you know what it was? It was a different song. Because that came a little later. It was a band called Chase. They were a jazz rock band on Epic Records. And their song came out three, four months before and was going up the charts at that period of time. And they were on Epic. They were called Chase had a song called Get It On, and the chorus was, get it on in the morning now. And and so Reprise was like, well, they're not, we want to make sure they know which song it is. So they, that's why they flipped the title. I did not know that. I was always told it was because of the uh, Let's Get It On. Yeah, which the, was um, later, Mark. which was a song that came out a bit later. So that was the real reason. So, yeah, I, you, that way, when you get some time, you go online, you know, when you're, when you're home chilling out. Check out this band, Chase Get It On. That was the reason why they changed it. And, of course, the T-Rex song, is you know like a miles uh more important than you know has had more of an impact but stand corrected or i sit corrected i had no idea that's a good pub quiz question now yeah I no that. i want to let you know because i thought you'd really appreciate that you know because i know you love the you love those records like i do these these a stories are, bit of trivia these do. stories are absolutely amazing hey you know um this box set was it fun to put it together was it a good time like i know you did it. a lot of the laboring was you you had done tell me about was, I mean, was that one of the things that really was good and kept you busy during the whole pandemic thing too, where you just kind of dug into that? Well, we've been, we'd started the box sets before the pandemic, so I knew what was coming, you know. When we, once we'd done the first one, we'd figured out there's probably going to be four, which is why it's a bit of a clue, really. If you put the three on a, on a, on a shelf, you've got three quarts of the Def Leppard triangular logo. Yeah, it looks so, great. It looks great. He really doesn't take a rocket science to figure out there's going to be a box four. Yeah. But yeah, it's been a lot of fun. You know, I did the first one out of, um, well, I just, I kind of just took the lead because I had all the songs in, in my archives. And so once I presented it to the guys in the band, I said, look, this is my theory. This is what I think we should put on there. Um, this is a running order that I propose. And here's why, because for the first time in, in a, in a, couple of decades we actually have to pay attention to the length of each side because it's vinyl and it's 180 gram which means they don't want us to go much further than 18 20 minutes otherwise it starts to suffer quality wise so the running order is sort of compromised unless you really get into the nitty gritty which is what i did i wanted to make it work as a listening thing but i also wanted it to fit this new format so that we didn't lose quality and once I got it down, I said, it just works out perfectly because this, these songs really work well together and they come in at the right times. And the rest of the guys said, fine. I said, do you want me to just take this and run with it? And they said, absolutely, go for it. So I obviously, I obviously once I've put it all together, I send it to 
whoever's interested uh, to, to like, you know, quality control check that I've not gone around the twist. And they've all said, no, man, it's great. Go ahead. So we're a good friend of ours. Paul Elliott does all the liner notes with us. He knows the band inside out um, and gets good stories out of the band because they're comfortable talking to him. All the Ross Alvin photographs speak for themselves. But the music, I'm lucky that we're having this mind up here that's logged all the archive stuff. I'm always aware that it's there somewhere. You know, people said to me when we did the first box set, the 1980 live album from Oxford, why has he never seen the light of day? And we said, well, there never seemed to be a time or a place to do it until now. He said, how did you even remember it existed? And the reason I remember it existed is because every day I walk past this row of cassette tapes <laughs> on one spine, it says Oxford 1980. And I'd see it every three or four weeks. It's never left the, you know, never left the memory bank. So I was always aware it was there. We just needed to find the master tapes, bake them, convert them and dehiss them and then do a proper mix of it. So there wasn't, you know, it wasn't that critical so much on the third box set. We weren't going that far back. So a lot easier to remember, but it was, it was difficult kind of tracing down Perfect Girl, for example, which was uh, when it was fashionable to give a song away a month on your website back in 99, 2000, 2001. We did that with this song that we'd reworked into, I think, Gravity or into Scar, Scar it was. Yeah. Um, and it's like, we found it, we tracked it down, but we could only track down a very squashed MP3 mono version of it. But we figured if we at least, you know, clean it up, dehiss it, it may lack a bit of quality from a sonic point of view, but from a historical point of view, it's very important for this box set, which is why we put it in. Um, so, you know, it is fun. And it, it, did, it did take up a lot of my pandemic time. But I was happy to do it because it gave me something to do. You know, the band of uh, spread out all over the world. So anything that we do, we have to do remotely. Um, because I was doing this on my own, it was actually kind of easy, really. And then I could just send an email to the guys going, this is how it's turned out. And, you know, no objections. So there you are, box three, you know. And it was really kind of cool to tidy everything up, get it into the one place, because it had fragmented over the last decade or two. Um, and put it all back together again with the bonus material and, and have it in some kind of sequential order so that it, to, the, to the fan that really cares, it all makes sense. It's not higgledy-piggledy all over the place. Yeah. It, it's got, a, it's, it's, it's got a, a sense and a, a rhyme and a reason to it. Thank you so much. You know, I, Joe, this was great. Thanks for taking the time today. I uh, loved catching up with you, man, and talking to you about all these things. You know, I'm always here. Yeah. You know, uh, again, uh, next time you're in uh, L.A., when you finally do come through again, we can't wait to see you play live. I know that that tour will be rescheduled. I'm very excited about that. You know, um, everybody's will. still talking about it. And uh, I look forward to catching and I, you. And I, look forward, I look forward to it as well, because the, the, the one thing that when I get together with Nikki Six, all we talk about is glam rock. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's so so much fun. I've done, I used to do his radio show a bunch of times when I was putting the down and out stuff out, and it just inevitably went him down that road. And he's like me. He him and Joan Jett grew up on British rock. Yeah, you know, on a lot of British rock. And so there's always, you know, it's it's nice to know that in that corner of the world, there's a couple of people that you can talk to, and you've got a lot in common because our musical upbringings were very very similar. You know, so you know next year. She, it, it will happen. I'm sure it will happen. And I'm, you know, obviously two cancellations or two postponements rather um, is very sad and annoying, but um, we'll be rocking and ready to go when the yeah. time comes. That'll be great. Joe, thanks for taking the time. Well, then you have the box set three. <laughs> yes. Volume three. It's out right now. Joe, thanks so much for uh, catching up with us. It was great. Thank you. Great Appreciate talking it. rock and roll with you today. I loved it. Great talking about all the great coverage. You too, man. Awesome. All right, everybody. Stay well out there. We'll see you soon, Joe. Stay well, everyone. You got see it. See you next year. I will see you next year. We'll look forward to it. Joe Elliott, everybody, Bye. from Def Leppard. Don't forget, Volume 3, the box set, is available now. There is the nine vinyl album collection, and then there is a six CD one, and you can also get it digitally. You've been watching KLOS, new and approved. I'm your host, Matt Pinfield. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I'll be back with you real soon.